count your blessings, name them one by one. And certainly I think all of us can count as a true blessing being a member of the Lord's Church. And I personally count, and I know our family does, of being a member at West Fayetteville. We're so thankful, and every day that's a, something that's on our minds as being a true blessing in our lives. If you're our guest this morning, we are so thankful that you are here. And we hope that you'll be able to come back again and visit with us, study with us, worship with us as you have opportunity. As Gerald mentioned earlier uh, in the announcements, um, what a wonderful week we've had with our Vacation Bible School. We've got revival coming up, a lot of great things going on, a good spirit is happening here as far as the good works, the involvement, the participation, even from uh, area congregations being involved, and so we're so happy with that and such a, such a blessing. I wanted to share one thing too, you know, the, even VBS was a success, I think, even getting a pie in the face. And, you know, it was, it was one of our elders' ideas for us to get up and then kiss our wives after that. So there you know where that comes from. Just to throw that out there. There's a little orneriness going on there. But a, a time of fun, a time of, of good stuff happening. And, and it's good for us to share those times and uh, cut up a little bit, but as well have serious time to teach the Bible and be together. I want to extend to all of our fathers a happy Father's Day this morning. You know, it's been said, and I think it's true, being a father is not easy, but it's worth it. Think about that. It's not an easy role. No, no role in a relationship, I suppose, is easy, but there's, all, there's always challenges to every role that we find in the family. Being a father is not easy, but as we stated, it's worth it. The Bible gives us instructions on how to do it right. For example, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, Paul said, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Notice in that passage what fathers can do, what dads can do to make a difference and what they can do for their children. William Hendrickson, in his commentary on Ephesians, listed six ways that are possible to provoke our children. And he stated, number one would be by overprotection. Then he stated by favoritism. The third one was by discouragement. The fourth one, he said, by failure to make allowance for the fact that the child is growing up and has a right to have ideas of his own and need not be an exact copy of his father to be a success. And I thought that was a real interesting one in that list and so true. Number five, he said, by neglect. And then the sixth way he listed that we may provoke our children to wrath would be by bitter words and outright physical cruelty. What does it mean to bring up a child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Well, it means bring them up in, in discipline, in training, education by disciplinary correction. Another stated, this includes the whole process of instruction and discipline. Discipline, not merely punishment, but also a strict ordering of the household. And then another one listed it this way. This may be described by training by means of rules and regulations, rewards, and when necessary, punishments. But it refers primarily to what is done to the child. But what a great verse. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. And notice we quickly listed those six things that could be possibilities of violating that. But he says, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. There's a key there, isn't there? How we're to bring them up, where, when we're to bring them up, and so forth. As we think about this, dads can make a difference. Think about our world in which we live today and how man has been, you know, Abuse taken out of the picture to a degree, a large degree. Fathers, fatherhood, being a man. It's looked down upon. It's ridiculed. But God's word continues to be the same 
as it always has been, to remind us of our roles, our specific roles as men and fathers and husbands. And then it relates things to mothers and daughters and family and, and all that's involved in family and relationships and the home. Dads make a difference. Let's think about what dads can do for their children specifically today. Think about how dads need to pray for their children. This may be one of those things that is often overlooked. You know, often as a Christian, just in general, we find that we get busy, we get wrapped up in our day, we get wrapped up in our work and our, the things of the world, and before you know it, hours have gone by. Have we prayed at all? Have we approached God? Have we approached the throne of God through the name of Jesus in prayer? Have we communicated to God? Have we shown God and, 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 you know, lived out the fact that we need God, we depend upon God? That's a part of what prayer is, isn't it? Our dependence upon our Father in heaven. But think about how powerful a situation it is for fathers, not only to pray for their family, pray for their wife, but pray for their children. Pray to God in regards and on behalf of their children. In Mark 9 and verse 24, the father that had the son, that had the demon. In Mark 9 and verse 24, immediately the father of the child cried out and said, Jesus helped them, if you recall, and relieved the child of this. But the father cried out and prayed, I believe, help my unbelief. He was wanting to be the right kind of dad, the right kind of father, the right kind of person in relation to Christ, in relation to God. But he acknowledged his need and the help that he needed from God, from Jesus. I believe. Help my unbelief. Think of Job as a great example of one who valued the spiritual welfare of his children. In Job chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says his sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, Thus Job did continually. Think about how easy it would have been for Job, who was a wealthy man, to have neglected his children and to have, you know, concentrated his efforts, his attention on that, on his life, on his world, on his business, or whatever affairs he was conducting as far as the world. But think about how he valued the spiritual welfare of his children. He said, that's far greater and he knew it was important to offer to God on their behalf as the father of the home, the father of the family. I think all of us could say we need more fathers, we need more dads like Job. And like the one we mentioned in Mark 9 who wants to rely on God and is asking God for help and assistance and direction and leadership. What about David toward the end of his life? You know, as David prepared to pass the leadership over to his son Solomon, he prayed a special prayer, and this is found in 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 19. David prayed, he said, Give my son Solomon a loyal heart to keep your commandments and your testimonies and your statutes, to do all these things and to build the temple for which I have made provision. Think about that. He was wanting to leave something that had spiritual value that was going to last beyond this world's goods, this world's materials, this world's fame and fortune. He wanted him to keep his heart loyal to God, to keep God's commandments, his testimonies, his statutes, and to do all these things and then to build the temple and honor God with that. He had spiritual work in mind, spiritual direction. That's the most important, isn't it? 
no matter what is in this world or what we would accumulate or have or, or honor or fame or attention, isn't the focus in our relationship with God and on God for ourselves and our family the greatest thing we could have, the greatest connection, the greatest gift that a dad or a father could leave is that spiritual heritage. There's none greater. And so we want to pray for them as fathers, as dads. Pray for them. Pray with them. Let them hear your prayers to God. And so we want to have prayer as a part of what we give to our children. Secondly, what about spending time with them? A recent survey revealed that the average five-year-old spends only 25 minutes per week with his dad. Now that's going to vary. We know this is a survey, but think of what that says. And then most children... Some of these studies are saying spend about 35 hours per week with some type of digital device. Think about what is getting, where the attention is with young people on something that's TV, phone, computer, laptop, whatever, and not getting other attention or interaction. We, well, this has been coming on for quite a while. To where now everybody has, we all have a device we carry. And you'll see this out. And was just recently we commented upon, we were out somewhere eating and there was a table and there was three, there was a mom and dad and a, a young girl. And don't you know, as soon as they sat down, they were, on, they were all three on the device and the girl put in her earbuds. And that's the way they sat through the whole meal. No interaction with family. No relationship building, no sharing, at least as far as that goes, over a meal. If, that, if they do that over a meal, I'm sure they do that in the car and at home. We've got to take time, don't we? We've got to put the world aside. We've got to focus on one another and have one another time. And one of the greatest things, and this goes for all parents, doesn't it? Mom and dad. We need to spend time with our family, with our children. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. When do I do that? How do I do that? There's the key, isn't it? Spending time in the Word. Shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. The, Moses is stressing, isn't he, the importance of Spiritual growth in growing in the Word, spending time talking about God's Word, talking about the Bible, talking about all the valuable illustrations and Bible characters and all of that that God has provided for us. Certainly, he says, there needs to be time spent there where you can grow in your knowledge of God and His Word, grow closer to God. And so this is a part of that spending time, isn't it? When we give children our time, we're giving them our heart. We're giving them, you know, a piece of ourselves, aren't we? Which we're supposed to do. And use that as a time and an opportunity. Let's influence them in the right ways and obviously biblically. But spending time with them. Thirdly, consider giving them responsibility. In Matthew chapter 21, notice what Jesus teaches here and he tells a, a story of a father with two sons beginning in verse 28 of Matthew 21 and we know he says what do you think a man had two sons and he went to the first and he said son go and work in the vineyard today and he answered I will not but afterward he changed his mind and went and he went to the other son and said the same and he answered I go sir but did not go which of the two did the will of his father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. Now, Jesus teaches a, a big spiritual lesson here, doesn't he? about accepting the gospel, accepting the teaching of, of God in His Word and of Christ and of obeying the gospel and, and being faithful when we hear it. When we hear it, don't turn away from it. 
But notice what he states here. One son told his father he would work, but he didn't. The other told him he would not work, but he changed his mind and did. And obviously, we see God is showing us that we give responsibility out. And here, the father learned which son was obedient and which one was not, didn't he? By giving them responsibility. And so that's a a good thing, a healthy thing. Our society needs that, doesn't it? To teach responsibility. We've lived through some times, it seems like for a long time, that the the default is, all right, when I do something wrong, I'm going to blame him or her or them or this situation or how I was raised or my background or my job or my neighbor or whatever. We don't take responsibility. But we look for a way, I'll blame this over here or blame this person here. But we teach responsibility. We, we teach, look, be responsible. Be an adult in that sense. Grow up to learn that. But giving responsibility is a good thing, isn't it? And Jesus reminds us of that there in Matthew chapter 21. And so we think about giving responsibility and think about how this not only relates to the world and the work world or chores around the house as we are growing up and we, we learn responsibility that way. We're given a, ch- a task, a chore, and we learn. And obviously, oftentimes, it's not the most pleasant thing, right? If it's, uh, but we know that as we grow to an adult, it's the same way. There's still going to be jobs and things we have to do. Maybe we don't like them. Maybe we're not enjoying them, but they're things we know that's our responsibility, and we're going to do it because we ought to. And we know that's missing in a large percentage of our society today. But dads can help teach and relay responsibility to the children. So we think about this, spending time with our children, praying for them, giving them responsibility. But also, as we think about this, what about giving them a sense of identity? As we think about dads, we think about fathers, and we think about the example that Jesus left us. And so to be a a good dad, to be a great dad, think about that, that those of us that are fathers, we need to strive to be like the Lord, don't we? It's not within us to know it all. It's not within us to to model the right thing all the time. We, We know we don't. That's why Jesus has given us his life as a perfect example to look to, to follow in in attitude, in our hearts, in our actions, our deeds, our relationships, how we respond to things, how we respond to someone else. We have to keep going back to to the true, perfect pattern, don't we, of our lives. Isn't that why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And I love that verse because it reminds us, again, we don't have it all down, but we have to work at it. It takes effort. It takes study and prayer and practice to be an imitator and follow Jesus Christ. But Paul said, look, when you look at me, you know, don't don't imitate my flaws. Don't imitate my mistakes and my sins and sometimes my bad attitude or the wrong words I say. But he said, only imitate or follow me as I'm following the Lord in the right way. That's pretty clear, isn't it? And I think that's a message that we as the church and as Christians can send to other people outside. You know, often we're saddled with this, well, there's hypocrites in the church where you go. That's why I won't come. I won't listen to anything you've got to say. Think about that. We're all striving to live according to the way Jesus laid out for us, it shows, hey, we're not perfect. We don't have it all down all the time, but we're trying, we're striving. That's our goal, and we make mistakes and we fall short. Paul said that in Romans 3.23, but as Paul said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Peter then reminds us in 1 Peter 2.21, Jesus suffered for us. He left us an example that you might follow his steps. Look at what Paul told the Christians at Philippi. 
Philippians 2 and verse 5, he said, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Is it too much for a child to ask for a Christian dad, a Christian father? If I truly want to be a great dad, the closer I grow to God, the better dad or father I become. Think about that, though, how that's in every category, isn't it? For all mothers, for the children, for the fathers, whatever our role is, isn't that the true case? To be what God wants us to be, I've got to grow closer to God and Jesus and look at the life that Jesus left for me to follow. And then I'll be fulfilling that role. But to be a great dad, a good dad, the proper dad, I must imitate Jesus Christ. You know, it's important for our children to hear about, I think, those faithful examples that are in our families, that are in other families we know, that are in our church family. And certainly even in our history, you know, we, we turn over to Hebrews 11 and has not God given us a list there? of those that were to emulate, and because of their faith by faith, they trusted God, they had confidence in God's Word, they knew that what God said was right, and they were going to do what God said. And they persevered, and they were counted as faithful because they lived by faith. They walked by faith, not by sight. Well, I need to look into that. Hebrews 11, as a dad, and I need to read and, and study about all of these great individuals. And the concept there of obedience to God's Word so that I can give them a sense of identity. Here's who we need to be, people of faith, people of obedience. Grow up and be an individual known as a faithful Christian. Do we not think sometimes it's probably too often the case that we desire for our children, I want you to grow up and be this or be this, prominent in something of the world, prominent in some occupation in the world. And we fail to, to build within them the desire or the goal to especially our male children grow up to be a deacon in the Lord's church, be faithful, be a Bible class teacher, be an elder one day. Be a gospel preacher. And to our young ladies, grow up to marry those type of individuals who are faith, first and foremost, they're faithful to God. They're faithful to the Lord and His church. Isn't that what we should be instilling? And dads need to lead in that. Give them a sense of identity. Be identified with Christ. Be identified with His church. Why? That's where salvation is. And we go all the way back in Solomon thinking and Job thinking of the spiritual connection that he wanted his children to have with the God who created us, our Father in heaven. And so all of us, no doubt, have people in our family that we can think about, people in the church we've known over the years, other areas, neighbors, whatever, family, friends, who've been good models, who've been good examples to us as dads that we can look back to. Not only being fortunate to have a father that way, but dad had me spend a lot of time. I had five great uncles. In addition, I had three brothers that dad had that were great in and of themselves too that I looked up to, but I had five great uncles that were still living. And I got was fortunate to spend a lot of time around them. And I think that was deliberate on my dad's part because we'd go visit them a lot. And they had a lot of stories and they lived, you know, in previous generations and lived through a lot of things and had a lot of things that they would share and talk about. And I just soaked that up, but came to respect them for who they were and how they raised their families and how they lived their lives. We, we need to remember, we need to identify with faithful fathers. Again, not perfect, not perfect, but striving to be faithful. Isn't that the goal? to strive to be faithful to God in all of our regards, in all of our relationships. Think about why God said this to Moses in Exodus 10 and verse 2. He said, Tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son the mighty things I have done in Egypt 
and my signs which I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. There's God relaying, tell this to your children. Why? So they can respect God, their creator, the one who gives them life and leads them and feeds them and protects them and has promised them spiritual life and eternal life. But tell this in the hearing of your son and your son's sons. Tell this in the hearing of your children, the mighty things I have done. And so we, I, whenever we have this identity, it's going to strengthen our knowledge and our wisdom and most of all our relationship to God. As we close this morning in thinking about dads make a difference on this Father's Day, the statement there, the thing children want most from their dads, and this seems to, to come again from a lot of studies and a lot of surveys and experience as well. Couldn't we all agree this, this is a major one? The time, our time. So many things of the world is pulling us and clamoring for our time and our attention. Things with our work, things with our career, things with our friends, things with things of the world. But think about how important it is while we have opportunity here on this earth and we're blessed with some time to spend that time, quality time, with our family, with our children, as a dad, as a father, spending that time to help them, to mold them, and to help them make that connection to God and His Word and their spiritual life. A number of years ago, the spiritual sword did a whole issue on the theme, according to the Bible, parents should. I want to read a few of these as we close our lesson this morning. According to the Bible, parents should be truly thankful for their children and show that thankfulness. Recognize the great responsibility involved in being a parent. Parents should love God's Word and study it before their children. Parents should select a good environment in which to raise their children. Parents should teach their children by word. They should teach their children by example. They should teach their children to love God. They should teach their children to love and obey the truth. They should teach their children to keep themselves pure. They should teach their children to keep their bodies healthy. They should teach their children about sexuality. Parents should show their children that they love each other dearly. Parents should teach their children that God loves them. Parents should show their children that they truly love them. Parents should teach their children about the terrible consequences of sin. And then finally, parents should teach their children about the power of the blood of Christ to save them. There's another section to that with a lot of things doctrinally and biblically we can add to that list. But what a powerful list of studies and thoughts and reminding us it all centers in God and His Word, doesn't it? And that flowing out from there to teach our children these things and, and model them and, and imitate Christ in every possible way that we can. Fathers have been honored by God because God has given them the leadership, responsibility in the home. And so dads truly make a difference. Think about as leaders of the home, we have the potential to influence generations to come long after we are gone from this earth. Think of the power there. Think of the influence that we can have in molding our children to be right with God. This morning as we close our lesson and we think about being right with God, we think about our Heavenly Father. and We make spiritual transition and application at this point as we close our lesson and as we think about ourselves now as individuals, all of us, what relationship do I have with God, my Father? Am I in Christ, His Son, or am I still outside, wayward, lost, without God? 
We can change that in just a moment based upon our faith, our working, obedient faith to step forward and say, I'm ready to change my life and my status. I want to be right with God. I want to be joined again with my Father in heaven. And I, want, I do that through His Son. Jesus is the only way to the Father. And so I'm willing to show that I'm willing to repent of my sins and make the good confession that Jesus is God's Son. I'm willing to be baptized in water for the remission of my sins. I want to be a child of God. I want to be restored to God and His salvation. Possibly we've done that and maybe we've lived in such a way we know that we've, we've thrown that to the side. We've, we've cast that to the side because of our living or our attitude. And we need to be restored as a Christian through repentance and prayer. Can we help you this morning as we stand and as we sing?